Here we are talking about uh, this uh, called frequency principle in deep learning and uh, how to, to relate this to, the, to, to physics. Yes. So please, Zixin. Okay. Can you hear me, Haijun? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, first, I want to thank Haijun for inviting me and give me this opportunity to present our recent work. So this is a current uh, undergoing work. So if you have any comment, they will be very welcome. So today, uh, I will first thank you for inviting me and give me this opportunity to present our recent work. So this is the current uh, undergoing work. So if you have any oh, comments, since my computer has so today uh, I will first uh, I can me see myself. Me. Okay. Yeah. Hold Maybe on. you you you, you, you know start. Uh, let me share it again. Mm. Okay. So can you hear me? Yes. I can see mm. the screen. Okay. Okay. Good. So um, first, I will uh, give some takeaway information. So first, I will talk about a frequency principle uh, that the deep neural networks prefer low frequencies. Based on these understandings, we actually designed a multi-scale deep neural network. So um, I'm muted. Uh, right now, I'm muted or not? Um, oh, no, it's okay. 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 You can mm -hmm. hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. I will continue. So, uh, second, uh, uh, second, I will talk about a phase diagram uh, to understand the two-layer neural networks and try to understand the deep neural networks from a systematic uh, picture. So now let's talk about a macro perspective. So as we know that John. Neumann has said with four parameters you can fit an element to a curve and with five you can make him wiggle his trunk. So in physics we always try to use as less parameters as we can to fit a model. But this may be not true in the deep learning. Now let's take an example. So traditionally if you use a model to fit the training data like blue data points here and if you use a fourth order polynomial to fit the data, although you cannot fit the data perfectly, but actually you can recover the true model quite well. And if you increase the complexity of your model, such as you use 15 degree or polynomial model, you can actually fit the training data quite well, but you can see oscillation here. That means it almost fit the data very uh, significantly. So in traditional learning theory, actually, if you increase the model complexity, you can decrease the training error, but you can increase the test error. So this is traditional theory. That's why phenomenon said that you need to use as less parameters as you can. But in deep learning, that is a puzzle. So even the number of parameters is much, much larger than the number of training data. The deep neural network seems can always gener generalize well. And this is supported by a lot of uh, experiments. I want to go detail into this experiment, but I'll, we try to use a macro perspective to understand why the deep neural networks does not overfit even though the number of parameters is so many. So here's an example, suppose we are going to fit a target function that is denoted by this red curve. And the training data is denoted by this uh, blue data points and after training, the deep neural networks can well fit the target function as we can see here after training. But what we care is how the neural network fit the training data. So we want to see the training dynamics. So here is the dynamics movie. So before I uh, start the movie, let's describe these curves. This red curve is the target function. And this blue one is the deep neural network output at the first uh, training uh, epoch initial uh, output. And now let's take a look at this movie. So as we can see that the neural network, after some training steps, you will capture the landscape. And after some time, some details emerge and as the training keep on, you will converge the target function. So the deep neural network seems to capture the first the landscape and then more and more details. So to quantify this effect, it's very naturally to use Fourier analysis. So we perform Fourier analysis of the target function and the deep neural network output. So here the, blue, the red dashed curve is the FFT of the target function. As we can see, there are many peaks because in the 
the target function has sharp transition. It's not so continuous. Um, on a neural network, uh, the FFT is uh, denoted by this uh, blue line. And if you uh, train a neural network, and now let's take a look. This is the frequency and this is amplitude. So as the training goes on, the neural network will first capture the first peak, and then the second peak, and third, and fourth, and keep going until, until higher, higher frequency. So we can have an observation that the neural network captures low frequency components first while keeping other high frequency ones small, and then it gradually captures higher and higher frequencies. So we call this frequency principle or F principle. So the very simple idea is the deep neural network seems prefer low frequencies. So we use this to try to explain why there's not so much oscillations in the deep neural network, even though the number of parameters is much, much larger than the number of training data. But in this talk, I want to go, detail, go into detail of this frequency principle. We try to utilize this understanding to design the uh, uh, deep neural network structures to fit high frequency faster. As we know that it has some problems, high frequency actually are, pro are, are quite uh, important as such in some computational physics. So now let's, okay, let's uh, go to this application. So suppose we are, uh, let's consider a, a Poisson equation. So this is a Poisson equation with deleted uh, boundary condition. So you can solve this problem by just a very simple finite, finite difference scheme, just central finite difference uh, different scheme and you can get a, a linear system AU equal G and you can solve this linear system by like a, a Jacobi iteration or gauss sandel iteration and if you analyze this model more carefully actually you can find the low frequency low frequency converge much slower than higher frequency so this is very different from this different neural network now let's take a look how the neural network can solve such a um, uh, partial differential equation so to solve this partial uh, differential equation actually is equivalent uh, to solve the following variational problem. So this variation problem, uh, uh, the minimization of this problem actually is the solution of this Poisson equation. And this part is a uh, regularization part to try to uh, satisfy the boundary condition. So we parameterize the, the UX by a deep neural network. And the input is x and output is ux. So we only need to minimize the parameters such that uh, the u can minimize this variational form. So now let's take a look about this uh, training dynamics of different frequency. So uh, here is an example. So gx here is the right hand side term of this uh, Poisson equation, Laplace, uh, Laplace u equals minus g. Um, we choose this G because we want to have some high frequency components. So let's see, uh, take two, uh, three frequency components, a higher frequency one, median, and lower frequency. So this is Jacobi method, and this is an iteration epoch. And this color indicates the relative error of this different uh, uh, frequency. Red means the relative, relative error is very small. So from this picture, we can see that high frequency actually converge very, very quickly. However, the low frequency actually converge extremely slow compared to this high frequency one. But for different, different neural networks, this behavior is completely different. As we can see that the first frequency actually converge very fast, and the second one and the third one. So these two actually are very different. But as we know that deep neural network now uh, are applied into a lot of such uh, differential equation problem because it has a lot of potential to solve high dimensional problem, but you will suffer from high frequency curves. So how to solve this problem? Our idea is very naive or very simple. You just scaling the function. For example, this f is the original function and you just do a, a rescaling in the Fourier domain. So uh, suppose you are considering a function and the function at a frequency alpha k, but alpha is larger than one here. We just do this rescaling to another function, and the function, the frequency of this function actually is k. So the frequency for this function is smaller than the original function. So we only need to 
fit this uh, lower frequency one, then we kind of rescale back to high frequency one. So this is performed at a uh, foreign domain, but it's totally equivalent to perform at a, a spatial domain, just need to do a different direction. Uh, this alpha is in the rescale form. So since this rescale form is, uh, is uh, kind of approximated by this deep neural network, so actually we can have a lot of neural networks to perform it to fit different frequencies. So we have answers of neural network. Here HI is the um, one neural network. So we construct a structure called a multi-scale structure. So this multi-scale structure actually is consistent of uh, a lot of uh, sub-neural networks. So in each sub-neural network, it received the input X, but with a kind of rescaling factor, X, 2X, until NX. And they don't have any uh, connection between each other, so uh, you can save your uh, computation cost. So at the final, you just uh, uh, have a summation of all the output of this sub-neural networks, and you can have output. And you can have used the previous similar procedure to solve uh, like Poisson equation, Poisson Boltzmann equation, and so on. We have done a lot of experiments and we found that for this multi scale neural network, it kind of uniform convergence for its frequency and it's mesh free. You don't need to um, make any mesh, so it can deal with very complex domain and it's very easy to implement it. So you just need to uh, have slightly changed the network structure. Here's an example. So we compare the multi-scale neural network to a fully uh, connected uh, different neural network. So the normal case, we use a network with hidden layer 1,000 uh, neurons. For this multi-scale case, we use five sub-neural networks, and uh, each neural network has 200 hidden layers. So uh, from the perspective of the neural number, these two actually are the same. So, uh, but for this multi-scale one, you have much less uh, connections. So the computation cost is much smaller. So in this case, we uh, take an example. This is a 2D example. Um, this is an exact solution. And it has a lot of uh, different uh, scale of oscillations, uh, different uh, frequencies. And for the normal case, actually, it can only learn a low frequency, as we have mentioned uh, previously in the frequency principle. It prefers low frequency is very quickly at the capture low frequency, but not good at the high frequency. So you can see that uh, things in uh, this circle or things in these corners compared with this true case, actually, this is a uh, normal case. It's much more smooth. Um, you cannot uh, faithfully reconstruct uh, this oscillation case. But for multi-scale case, you can see that all these oscillations can be well uh, reconstructed or can be well captured. Now let's take a look at the training process, the error. This is L to L. For normal case, it, the error decrease much slower than the multi-scale one. Uh, for 2D case or 3D case, and we actually perform extensive experiments. Uh, like for 2D, 3D, uh, Poisson Boltzmann equation, and so on. If you are interested, you can uh, look for the paper, it just came out very recently. So now we have this micro uh, perspective to understand that in the, the neural network output actually uh, has some order from low frequency to high frequency, and it has shared some lines to understand the, uh, the generalization ability and can help us to design the neural network uh, structures. Now, let's try to understand why there is uh, such behavior. Let's go from a micro perspective and try to understand more. So there are a lot of related words that try to understand this uh, frequency principle. Now, let's take one. So let's take an example of two-layer neural networks. This H is a two-layer neural network, and you can see here there is a pre a factor or scaling factor, and this uh, A is the output weight, and W is the input weight. L is the bias here, slightly different from the common used one, but actually you can do it perfectly, almost uh, the same for normal case. But the scaling is important. So for, we consider for sufficiently large M, this uh, is very easy to understand. Uh, just like uh, in a statistical mechanics. Uh, you want to consider an ensemble, you always need to do the sum of dynamics limit. Okay, so in this uh, case, if we study from the first principle, means uh, we study the gradient descent of each uh, parameter. So that's the meaning why we call this uh, micro perspective. So we can get uh, uh, the, the dynamics of this uh, neural network output. This is the Fourier transform of the neural network output and the Fourier, this exceeds the Fourier frequency. And 
this is the coefficient. Okay, so this uh, this part actually has very interesting properties. So HP means HP means you uh, times this uh, uh, sampling density. If you have discrete sampling density, it's just a summation of delta function. So this equation stops when your training output at the training data, your neural network output at the training data equals to your training uh, samples. Okay, so this makes sense, uh, or equivalent to our training process. Now let's take a look at this coefficient. It's a very interesting case, uh, one. So this uh, uh, black data actually is the uh, uh, mean uh, taken uh, with res respect to the initial parameter uh, distributions. And this can see the, prim uh, the frequency. As we can see that when you increase the frequency, actually this coefficient decreases. So this reflects the frequency principle, right? And one more interesting thing is the solution of long-term limit, long-term limit of this ODE actually is equivalent to the solution of this minimization problem. And this minimization problem actually gives us a lot of information. So um, I, I, don't, I wonder go to in the detail of this proof, but it's actually very simple. This is the kernel rigid equation. So there is a minus one here. So uh, there's a C square in the, uh, in the new, uh, denominator. So uh, this part actually is kind of increased as the frequency increase. So the penalty will be larger for this high frequency component, meaning this neural network will find a solution that can satisfy the training data, but has as less low frequency as it can from all solutions that can fit in training data, but it prefers low frequency. Okay, now let's take a look more. So if you only have one part that is fourth order part, actually this is in the cubic explain. So, and just to give us a very intuitive understanding of how, of how deep neural network interprets the uh, training data. And if you only have uh, this minus uh, two, uh, term, this is the linear split. So now let's take a look at here. So if you have different parameter setup, you actually have different uh, uh, interpolation result. So it's very important to study the different parameter regime. So we are going to uh, understand this different parameter regime. So we're going to draw a phase diagram for neural networks. As a first step, we will try to do it for two-layer neural networks. Now let's take an example of this. Um, uh, fluid dynamics or like uh, uh, water the phase diagram of, of water. So as we know that you, you can see the, the index, uh, the coordinates like a pressure or temperature and you can draw a phase diagram for water and we can benefit a lot from this uh, phase diagram because like in this part is solid and this part is liquid, they have a lot of similarity, dynamic similarities. So if you know some point in this liquid and you have another point of liquid, you know they must have some similarities. So that's the uh, kind of starting point or motivation of why we want to draw a phase diagram for uh, neural networks. So we can see the very naive model. This is the two layer ReLU neural networks. So we can see the very general of uh, general form of neural network. You have a pre-scaling factor, the input weight and output weight are WK and AK. You can consider high dimensional case and the initialization, uh, this AK is initialized by uh, Gaussian distribution with uh, standard deviation beta one and WK beta two. And we train this neural network with a uh, mean squared error. So, why we say this is a kind of very general form? Because if you take alpha equals to square root m, that is NTK, a very well studied, uh, just as in previous examples, we use this case. Uh, if alpha equals m, and this is in the mean field. So these two actually are very popular types in the last few years in the uh, uh, theoretical study of neural networks. So to study this model, actually, we need to do some uh, normalized or non-dimensionality. Uh, to understand this, actually, you can think about uh, this Reynolds number, why we want to define Reynolds number. Because uh, uh, although sometimes you can have different scales, different uh, kind of um, parameters, but they have dynamic similarities. So if you uh, compute the Reynolds number, they, are, they have the same Reynolds number, you know they have some uh, uh, dynamic similarity. That's a similar idea. So we know that this A and W, they are initialized by some uh, 
uh, Gaussian distribution with beta one and beta two. Uh, to derive a kind of normalized model, we actually can do this rescaling. This AK can be rescaled by this beta minus one, and WK can be rescaled by beta minus two. Also, we can have time uh, rescaling. So after do, uh, doing this rescaling, actually we can uh, derive a normalized model. So for any model we have, we can just uh, compute their uh, normalized A or their normalized W. So what we care is the long-term solution of the neural network. So actually, uh, here are three parameters, kind of A, W, or T. They have different three scales, but T, the scale of T is not important because we, care, we only care about the, the final solution, the well-trained uh, state. So actually, there are only two uh, kind of independent coordinates for this final solution. Okay, so from this dynamics, from the gradient design, actually we can, we can see there are only two uh, important uh, quantities. The one is beta two minus uh, uh, over beta one. The other is beta one, beta two over alpha. So we use these two as a kind of index. So we define the kappa and kappa prime. However, as we want to consider this uh, m, uh, this neural number goes to infinity. So as we mentioned before, this alpha actually could goes to infinity or goes to zero. So there may not be uh, perfect uh, uh, quantity for index in the uh, first diagram. But actually, we can use their rate, how they goes to uh, infinity or goes to zero with respect to this neural number. So we define this gamma and this uh, gamma prime. Okay, this gamma actually is the decay rate or kind of the rate of this uh, kappa with respect to this m. And this gamma prime is for this ka uh, kappa prime. So, Let's take an example, suppose gamma prime equals to zero. We take different gamma, and you can see, we learn these four data points uh, with different gamma. You can see they have different uh, learning results. So we first, uh, okay, so we want to uh, classify this model into different regimes. So the first step is what kind of regimes uh, is the best to classify? So this is the model, right? But if this sigma is a kind of, uh, linear or this part does not change during the training. This is the random feature. For random feature model, you can just perform this linearization. Uh, we actually ignore the initial output because usually the initial output can be offset to zero. So what's the meaning of the uh, linear model? Meanings the this model can be linearized uh, with respect to this initial uh, parameter or you can do in the first order tele expansion. If this is a linear model, all the things are very simple. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's understand in what case it will be linear model. So since the only nonlinear part is sigma, so if this W parameter does not change a lot during the training, that means this model can be linear model because it's close enough, you can do the tele expansion. So we only need to examine the relative difference of this uh, W. Okay, so this CW is the collection of all W. This gamma equals 0, 0 0.5, as we can see, as the m neural number goes to infinity, the relative difference goes to zero. So in this part, we can understand that it can be well approximated when uh, m goes to zero by first order uh, tele expansion. For the second case, gamma equals to one, the difference or the change is order one. So this actually a kind of critical point. Uh, for uh, gamma equals to 1.75, as m goes to infinity, it goes to uh, implant. So this is not a good uh, a linear case. This is a nonlinear case. So we know that for that, uh, we normalize the, the model and use gamma and gamma prime to index this uh, uh, dynamic behavior. So if we change different parameters, but they have gamma, same gamma and gamma prime, you can see the slope, the slope of this uh, change is the, uh, uh, vertical coordinates here are almost the, the same. That means the effectiveness of our uh, coordinates for first diagram. So now, next, we can uh, try to uh, study the relative difference of the theta W. Actually, we study this uh, slope and try to classify the regime. So we found that actually for different gamma and gamma prime, a large regime actually they been, can be classified into linear regime. And this is in the red part. And the blue part, the, uh, the slope is larger than zero. So you will go to infinity after m goes to infinity. So this is a nonlinear regime. And in the, this uh, uh, boundary, 
are separate, these two regime, actually the change is all the one. So we actually have a very simple way to classify the linear, the neural network into a very simple first diagram. But this is very important because as we can see here. So a lot of other studies actually uh, study the behavior or the properties of the neural network dynamics. And like uh, this NDK or mean field or some other works like Professor Winayi's work, a lot of other works. But actually in this first diagram, they only study uh, at some uh, point here or there. And we already know their studies has a lot of similar similarities, but actually we don't have a kind of uh, conclusion picture to understand why they have a similarity or uh, are they in the same regime. So this, this work actually are kind of as an initial step, I try to understand that this uh, first diagram for two layer neural networks. And in the future work, we try to uh, understand more about this uh, more deep neural network, not just two layer, and try to figure out the first diagram for the neural networks. So finally, still the takeaway information. And if you're interested, you can go to my website. And the key point here is the frequency principle about this low frequency preference and some network uh, structural design, and finally a uh, first diagram for two-layer neural networks. And thank you. If you have any problem, Zixin, thank you. Yeah. So there is a question in the question and the answer. Mm -hmm. Can you see? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, today I didn't go into uh, kind of uh, maybe you you first uh, read this question. Uh, Okay, I, I can describe my, my question first. So, uh, uh, the audience said, um, my talk, many talk about a curve fitting, fitting. However, we know deep neural network or machine learning was not designed for just a curve fitting. What people really care about in deep neural network is generalization power. How do you relate the generalization power to your frequency analysis? Okay, uh, I didn't show the result, but actually we have other results for this. Um, okay, so. Let me relate it to here. For example, here. So you can also perform this uh, like following analysis for like a, a classification task. Okay, here is an example for MNIST or CIFAR 10. You can use a fully connected or convolution neural network. It's also okay. And you can perform this uh, following analysis from this mapping from image to the label. And you can pick a direction like a principle, a first principle direction to see it. You can see in such a task, actually, low frequency still dominates. So these red data points are the training data, and this uh, green one is the owner data. You can just perform for analysis. And the neural network of fitting actually may fit in the low frequency very well, but in high frequency, it has slightly different. So since the low frequency pre uh, preference of the neural network is consistent with the low frequency dominance of the data so it can uh, work fit well and the generalization is good however for other tasks like this parity function it has very different behavior if you perform for a transform of this parity function this function is defined by on this minus one or one two data points and uh, the output is just the, the the multiplication of all uh, coordinates. In this case, high frequency actually dominates. So in this case, if you don't have enough samples, actually you don't have all samples, your learning actually will have more power at a low frequency and less power at a high frequency. And the learned curve in the blue one is totally different from the uh, real case. So it doesn't have any generalization power. So even for this real image data case, we our follow analysis can also be applied. Okay. So I, I also have one question. So in oh, yes, in, in the second part, you you designed the method to to make sure that uh, the neural network can can name mm -hmm. all these different frequencies uh, the same. Yeah, yes. Uh, so for this for this things, would you need to have a knowledge about the, the frequency distribution of the original data? Uh, yeah, if you have uh, uh, information of the original data, you actually you can design much efficient uh, method to uh, faster capture the high frequency of the target function. Actually, Professor Tai, they have developed a method called a phase DNN. 
But in their method, you need to specifically uh, know the, where the high frequency is, and you can just do the shift the high the frequency to low one. But in our case, actually, uh, we don't have such accuracy. So we just uh, design an answers. You can understand this is just an answers, and you can from this um, uh, fitting, uh, we found that this answers actually did work well. All we can say it has this capability to transform this high frequency to low frequency. We we actually don't know if it can really do it, but actually in experiments it did. So that's uh, if you have information of the real target function, yeah, they will benefit a lot. Yes, also Professor Tang has a question. Yeah. Yes. Can you see? Uh, Professor Tang says. Let me check. Let me check. Okay. Um, in a sense, no, we discussed about it from the uh, mapping from STD to and then could you comment on relation? Oh, um, so so far, actually, we don't uh, work on this STD. Uh, we actually uh, work on this gradient um, descent, a full, fully gradient descent. If you add uh, so in several parts, if you add some gradient mass uh, stochastic or some noise in this um, uh, dynamics, uh, I believe this frequency principle actually still holds because uh, experiments uh, uh, show such as uh, phenomenon. Uh, the second is, um, I believe if you, if you write uh, this uh, SGD uh, more clearly, you can see more details, like uh, you may see more uh, relation about this uh, stochastic gradient descent to naturalization. And I, I know a lot of works out in these directions. Um, I actually don't read uh, too much about uh, Lenka's uh, work. I, I, re I read some of his, some of her work recently, very inspiring, especially the work that uh, call for the physicals to study the machine learning uh, on the deep learning theory. Uh, that's quite inspiring, but I don't quite uh, read uh, very carefully about his recent work on this SGD. I'll read it, so I could not comment too much on this. Okay, uh, so maybe the time is, uh, is up. We think Zicheng again, and okay, then we go to the next uh, talk.